It's timely. It's insightful. It's motivating. It's empowering. It's time with Fred, your inspirational broadcast with host Fred Gaddy. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Time with Fred podcast. This is a podcast that challenges paradigms and mindsets that hold us back. I have with me today a very special guest, Mr. James Bond, not 007, by the way, but James D. Bond joining us via Zoom from Shaker Heights, Ohio. Uh, Jim is a 29-year survivor of multiple myeloma, a deadly blood cancer for which there is no cure yet. He's here. He graciously agreed to come on to share his story with us. What got me interested in the story, because I lost a family member not too long ago through myeloma, and um, I was really interested in getting Jim on to share his story, which he's shared many, many, many times. But uh, stay tuned. And if you know someone who's dealing with this or have a family member or friend who's dealing with myeloma, there's a lot of information here that I'm, I'm sure you'll find really valuable. So, Jim, welcome to the Time with Fred podcast today. Well, Fred, thank you very much for having me and for those kind words introducing me. And I do want to make it clear that despite the James Bond 007 spy movie, <laughs> you're listening and seeing the real James Bond. That's right. I, I'm not a movie actor. I'm not a Hollywood type. But my beautiful Bond girl of 51 plus years is in the other room and if we're lucky she'll she'll show herself but she's a she's a gorgeous woman and i do feel like i'm the real james bond and and coincidentally my job before i retired at the mandatory age that my firm said my job was not really spying but it was uh kind of in that arena i was a, a an auditor for a large auditing firm and we did audit, private audits of uh, large companies. So, in a way, <laughs> there's some element, know, right, of spying there, right? <laughs> there is, there is, there is a little bit of a common ground that, that absolutely, but, uh, yeah. But we have been fortunate in uh, having nice, kind people like you, Fred, ask us to share our story. Oh, in you. fact, we've done that over. We've shared this over 300 times and over 150 cities, 41 U.S. states, Canada, Latin America, Japan, Spain, wow. and New Zealand. So we really do live in a global world. And the world of myeloma and blood cancers is, is pretty closely knit, even though there aren't that many of us probably – I don't know, around 150,000 or 200,000 of us alive at any one time. Uh, the death rate is uh, real, and the, the average patient only lives seven years. And that's up from three years when I was diagnosed. So I really am a, a very blessed person, and I am an outlier in being a 29 year. Yes. Yes. And and why that's so is uh, I've got some strategies that, that we, we use that I think are good for handling difficult situations, whether it's cancer or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I'll share a few of those. Absolutely. But, and thanks for doing that. And I'd imagine, uh, Jim, for you know, considering the, the challenge and, and the difficult journey that you've had to go through and you're, you're being willing and open to share this, I mean, given the number of times you've done this, I think it goes to show your heart and, and your true oh. desire to, to help people overcome uh, this, uh, this, this difficult um, uh, and challenging disease. But, but how did you survive a deadly incurable cancer for 29 years? Well, I almost, I almost gave up. When I was diagnosed, I was a young guy. I was in my early 40s, married, happy, healthy. And our two sons were off starting college. So we were becoming empty. We were empty nesters. And I was required to have a physical examination by my firm. <clears throat> and they discovered this awful, deadly, incurable blood cancer, multiple myeloma which I had never heard of. And 
I was stunned. My wife was stunned. And this is this is really, I think, important to, to the way I operate and who I am. I ask questions and I listen carefully when I get answers. And I ask my diagnosing doctor, who is a good one at a good hospital. We have two leading cancer centers here, right here in our hometown near Cleveland, Ohio. I said, doctor, if you were in my shoes, mm -hmm. what doctor would you have to treat your disease? Would it be you? Which he assumed it would be. Mm -hmm. Or would it be somebody else? And I said, please don't limit yourself just to our hometown. Mm -hmm. And that surprised him. And he gave it real consideration, Fred. And he sat back and he said, well, he said, honestly, there's a, another oncologist across the street at, at our competing hospital, and he sees more of your type of cancer than I do. So for that reason, I think if I were you, I'd go to him. And Fred, that really touched me with the, because there's a, here's a young aspiring oncologist building his practice, and he was more concerned about me and my survival than he was his own business. So that impacted the way I did business from then on. But, but I did exactly what he, what he said. I went to a, a doctor that had more experience with the disease than he did. Yes. But I asked another question before I left his office with my wife. I said, how long will I live? And what would you do if you were me? He said, well, I really didn't want to answer the how long I think you'll live question. Mm -hmm. But if you're forcing me to, you're not going to live very long. In fact, it'll be more like months mm -hmm. if you do nothing. And if all goes well and you, you seek the treatments that we have available today, now remember this is back in 1992, mm -hmm. you'll live three years if all goes well. Mm -hmm. If all goes well. How does one process news like that? Um, well, you know. well, I ask a question. I said, "Okay, that's that's a tough one. We're like like you're kicking the stomach and you can't stand it." Mm -hmm. So I said, "Okay." So that being your your prognosis, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And he said, "Well, honestly, I might do my bucket list." Hmm. And we went home that weekend. And I gave real thought to doing, we gave real thought to doing our bucket list because I, I worked my whole life. And, you know, there were things we, we, we never got a chance to do. I thought, well, well, I'm healthy enough to do them. Maybe now is the time to do them. But Fred, I decided not to. And here's why. I looked back at my life and I said to myself, there was another setback that was on the health or medical side, I had a, I was an aspiring baseball player in high school and I had dreams of playing division one college baseball. And until I ran into a, a fence catching a, a foul ball that shattered those dreams along with my leg. And I would never be the same ball player. And that, that devastated me when I was a teenager and it happened. And I thought, this is terrible. You know, I'm never going to recover from something like this. Well, that doctor back then told me, you're not, you're not going to walk right. You're not going to run. You're just certainly not going to play again. But I worked hard. <clears throat> and I did, I did play again. Not, not at the same level, but I was able to play. And I thought, now that I had this cancer diagnosis, I thought, okay, why can't it turn out the same way? Because a lot of good things happened as a result of that baseball injury. For example, I studied much harder in college because I had more time on my hands. And if I had been struggling to make a baseball team, that I really wasn't going to make anyhow. And <clears throat> it really impacted me in positive ways. So I thought, let's give this cancer thing our best shot. My wife was with me every step of the way. She agreed. And we went to the second doctor and started out. So that, so that, that's really how we processed it. We just, we just gave some thought to, are we really in this thing or not? Yeah. 
and we decided we were in it. And then we decided, okay, it's going to get, it's going to get all we've got to give and see what, see what happens. Jim, what role does mindset play um, in this process? I mean, you asked a very powerful questions, which I'd imagine um, led you down that, that path of, of seeking a, a second opinion. Oftentimes, you know, we, we, we leave these, um, you know, solutions to, to the so-called experts, right? Doctors, the oncologists, after all, they, they, they know it. I mean, they are the experts in this, in this field. What made you want to seek a second opinion and ask these questions? Um, That's a very good question. Yeah. That's a very good question, Fred. It's, it's really my nature to challenge, mm -hmm. to challenge things and not, not necessarily take things at face value the first time I hear them. And that's really what I was paid to do as an auditor is to is not only ask hard questions, but then to to think about the answer and think of think about whether I had more questions or whether it made sense or whether I was going to do more. Mm -hmm. And and so and so my I'm stubborn. <laughs> I'm, I'm a stubborn guy, and for all the right that, reasons, right? I mean, it, it has it has its benefits too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not apologizing for being stubborn. It, it it's helped me out. Yes. It helped me here, but I also had the the huge support of my my great wife Kathleen, who who was all in. And <clears throat> my first ten years of this disease, I was were not planned out. I mean, I was hoping to get you know, a little more than three years, they had said it was possible. So at that time, there was a procedure that was kind of experimental. It was called a bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. And it's involved, you got to go in the hospital. It's not pleasant. And it, it was like buying an insurance policy that the remission I was able to achieve with chemotherapy. It was a little bit of insurance that maybe the permission would last more time before the disease would eventually come back, but we all knew it was going to come back. So I went for that and uh, I did, I got a nice long five year plus remission. And the whole time, the whole time I was badgering the transplant doctor who did the transplant. When this comes back, can I do another one? And he said, oh, Jim, I don't think you can do another one because we had to use full body radiation on you. We're not sure we can do another transplant with your own cells. So he was kind of putting me off and I kept insisting <laughs> and I'm stubborn. <laughs> and finally, I wore him down. He said, OK, he said, I'll tell you what, Jim, if you're willing to go out of town and go up to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and, and get a second opinion from the Roger, uh, from the Mayo Clinic. If their expert up there thinks you can live through a second one, then I'll I'll do it here. So my wife and I did. We went out of town, got the second opinion. The doctor up there said, "Yep, yeah, it'll work. We're happy to do it here if you don't if you don't want to do it at home." I said, "No, I'm happy at home. I just <laughs> my guy needed to feel good, so went home and did a second one." And that lasted a few more years. So I'm thinking, this is great. Well, in the meantime, the doctor who was recommended by the diagnosing doctor who knew more about myeloma, he said, Jim, you have two living sisters, don't you? I said, yep. He said, let's test them to see if their cells match yours. And one of them did. My older sister, Becky, matched. And he said, well, that's great. Let's, let's harvest her cells the right kind of cells and we'll do a, we'll do a special kind of transplant for myeloma patients. We don't do them very often. Again, this is, you know, 19 years ago. Mm -hmm. He said, we don't do these very often. They're kind of risky taking someone else's mm -hmm. stem cells, inject them into your body. It's going to be hard and we're not sure it's going to, how well it's going to work, but it's all we got left. So I said, yeah, it sounds good. Let's try. So they did. And I got my sister's cells. And my wife likes to joke that I've been more fun to shop with. So I got the female, female cells circulating around my body. 
My wife's a funny girl. So that was great, except that her cells were not strong enough to battle the myeloma, which had risen to a very high level. And I was, I was in trouble. I was sick. I mean, we're, my fever was, was getting up to 104, 105, unable to eat. My legs were swelling up. And I was having to get whole blood transfusions every other day to keep me alive. Mm -hmm. Finally, my doctor said to me, Jim, we're going to have to send you to a hospice. You're all done. There's nothing left to treat you. Mm -hmm. And again, <laughs> Not, not willing to take that answer. I said, no. I said, what about, what about the clinical trial I heard about when we were out of town a second time before the last transplant? I always ask the question of the out-of-town expert. I say, what's new and on the horizon that might be of value to my case? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there's a clinical trial that's showing good results for sick myeloma patients like you. On a preliminary basis, it looks like it's promising. He said, if I were you and I get in trouble, I'd think hard about that. So we did. I brought that up to my local doctor. He said, oh, I know all about that. Mm. He said, you're wasting your time. To even try. And I thought, oh, that's pretty weird. You just told me to go to a hospice. How can I possibly be wasting my time? Mm -hmm. And he was a little bit annoyed with me and walked out of his office and left us sitting there. I went back to my office and called and got some names of some hospitals that could, could have an opening for me. And I got a call back one Friday afternoon. I was still practicing my accounting auditing profession. I'm praying for someone to call me back with an opening somewhere. And it was a, a young British doctor on the other end of the phone. He said, Jim. Paul Richardson here up at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I know a little bit about your case and only have two questions for you about admitting you into our trial. He said, one, how soon can you get here? I said, tomorrow. He said, well, that's Saturday. I said, yeah. He said, no, Monday would be fine. I said, okay, Monday. And he said, two, are you willing to relocate and live here with your wife in the greater Boston area, 600 miles from our Cleveland area home for nine months. Now, Fred, this guy's talking nine months. I just been told to go to a hospice. So I, mm -hmm. said, I couldn't say yes fast enough. I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm willing to do that. So I go home and start packing for nine months. But I noticed my wife seemed to be packing more for what looked like a weekend than nine months. But I shrugged it off. I was not feeling great, not thinking all that clearly. But when my other sister and her husband dropped us off at the airport and my sister hugged me, it felt more like a hug mm. goodbye forever mm. rather than just a goodbye for this trip. But again, I shrugged it off. We got to Boston. I went right to bed. I was sick. I couldn't eat. My wife panicked. She called the emergency number at uh, Dana Farber and got the doctor on call and he talked her through getting me through the night, calmed her, calmed her down. And he said this, <clears throat> he said, Mrs. Bond, did anyone tell you that when your husband entered our trial, he was the seventh patient in this part of the trial and that made him patient number 007. And he said, he said, I think that I think that's good karma, Mrs. Bond. <laughs> well, it was good karma. I got started on the clinical trial. And Fred, this is this is the most dramatic part of our, our unlikely story. Within within two weeks of this experimental drug, 99% mm -hmm. of my cancerous cells went away. Mm -hmm into remission. That didn't mean cured, but they went into remission. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim, when you moved to uh, was it Boston, what happened to work? Did you, did you take time of work? Did you, did you resign? That's, did a great, you... that's a great question. I left that out. I, 
I took work with me. I could work remotely. By then we had we had laptops. We're in we're in the year 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002. And so I was able to do my work over the telephone, mailing stuff up. I had a laptop. So that was working out. You mentioned in an article that you wrote that you found it helpful to inform uh, more people to support you. Uh, this allowed you to let go of some of your feelings. Uh, you realized that when you had to miss other commitments, other people stepped in to help. Now, this is this is a yeah. serious case of vulnerability here because not a lot of people are comfortable, you know, opening up that way. Uh, but right. in your case, you realized that it was it was it was hugely beneficial when you had to let other people in, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm glad you asked that. At first. At first, we kept this closed. We kept it to our family and just a couple of people, my boss and my secretary. That was about it at work. But that, but after a year went by, I realized that was really selfish of us, of me, because my wife could use the support of her, her friends and, and those around her. So we opened it up. And my coworkers and my firm's name is Ernst & Young, change it to EY, but been around forever and <clears throat> or global or in Richmond and everywhere else. But they pitched in in an unbelievable fashion. I'm so glad you brought that up because without them, I, it wouldn't have been comfortable at all for me to continue my, uh, my client service service uh, job, but they, 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 they filled in for me and I'm very thankful for them. And I, I mentioned that, in a book that I'll talk about in a few, a few minutes, but but these hope lodges where people stay for free they're not well known, and my wife decided to raise awareness and funds for hope lodges while we're still out of town in this nine month adventure, and so she designed a fundraising event, and I watched her for and I asked her what's the event going to be. She said, well, it's going to be a bike ride from one end of our state up north here in Cleveland, 300 plus miles, four days down to end in Cincinnati. Now, both Cleveland and Cincinnati have one of these Hope Lodges. So she named it the Pan-Ohio Hope Ride. And she got the support of the American Cancer Society. And I watched her, Fred, for two years work really hard to get this thing off the ground. And I said, I neither one of us was cyclists. And she said, not to worry about that. I'll get I'll get people who knows how to cycle to help me. And she and the her co-leader who was a cyclist, they, they mapped it all out. Well, I'm watching them do this, and I I I felt guilty and I thought, okay, I'm gonna go out and buy a bike and give it my best shot. So I did. And <clears throat> I did the training that the experts told me I should do. And stayed safe and was ready to go. And before the ride was was to start the first one, we were at a fundraising event for a myeloma group and a local reporter here in town who knew a little bit about my story came up to our younger son, Bob, and said, Bob, do you really think your dad can do this? He's got some physical issues. He's battling this cancer. He's not a psychos. <laughs> You think he can ride 328 miles four days? Well, I got home that night, turned the TV on to hear Bob's answer. And Bob said, Bob said, well, he said, I don't know if my dad will make it all the way or not, but I'll say this about my father. <clears throat> when he says he's going to do something, he'll do it. I love it. I, love it. <laughs> I did too. I'm, I'm still deeply touched by that. But I felt pressure too. <laughs> I felt, okay, Bob. I got I got to make a pretty good showing here. So no, the expectations are high, right? It's it's yeah. on record now, so everyone has well, a feeling. Ra <laughs> raise that bar a little bit, and with the help of our older son Jim, who is a cyclist, and Bob's wife Stacy, who is a cyclist, they cycled with me, and they kept me out of trouble, kept me on the bike path, on the country roads, and I made it all four days. All 328 miles. That is awesome. And I did the same thing for the next 12 years. Wow. And I'm very, very proud of that. That is and awesome. <clears throat> thank you. And it, it, I not only did it 
to raise, help raise funds and awareness to these Hope Lodges, but also because it really aligns with one of the other key reasons I think I'm alive today. I believe in daily exercise. Now, <clears throat> I don't mean hard physical workouts every single day. What I mean by that is some days, like when I was going through those transplants I told you about, the most I could do is make myself sit up in bed. Mm. But I did that. I pushed myself to, to, to get out of the, the lying position and sit up. Then I made myself get out of that bed in a few days, holding on to the side for dear life. Then when I felt safe, I grabbed the IV pole. I had pumps going through, IVs going through me, and I walked the halls it, until the nurses got tired of bumping into me and got me a treadmill outside my room. So what I mean by daily exercise can be summarized in sit, stand, walk, mm -hmm. or on your feet, not your seat. Mm -hmm. So I do as much as I can, and that includes days when I really don't feel up to it. I push myself to stay safe, and do, but do something to try to keep myself moving around. I just came to that on my own because I'd always exercised during my life. And, and I thought the stronger body I can bring to the doctors for that whatever the next treatment's going to be, the better my chance will be to get through it. So that was my thinking. And it was it, 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 the Pan Ohio Hope Ride has been a big part of that. And the training for that and doing the ride were, were tremendous helps in, in keeping me going in those years. Now, you, you have a, another interesting part, uh, Jim, to, to, to your story. Um, and this was about the, uh, the pink Buick. You're, uh -huh. you're, you're driving to work one day when you had to call your wife to, to break the news. Can you oh, yeah. That? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that. It's a good time to bring it up. I told you I got a nice long five year remission from my first transplant right out of the right out of the shoot back in the early 90s. Well, I was doing great. No medications, you know, life seemed back to normal. But as my wife tells it, she was not. She was really emotionally not herself. And she was on edge. She was jumpy. Didn't know what to do. She knew it was coming back. We all did. Until one day, I went off to work to a client. <clears throat> and I ended up calling her on the phone and saying, honey, I'm okay. But our car is not. <laughs> I was at a, a stoplight. When it turned green, I went through the light. And out of nowhere, a pink Buick T-boned me, ran, ran their red light, and smashed right in, my, in the driver's side where I was driving, pushed my car into the car next to me. So my car was pretty damaged, but I was okay. Wow. <clears throat> so Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen's reaction, she went, she went bonkers. And she started screaming over the phone. She's going, what? How could you do this after all we've been through? How could you get in a car accident? <laughs> there, there were no cell phones. We were on, I was on a pay phone. And, and finally, she, I, just, I said nothing. I just, she caught herself and she realized, hey, that's the thing. You can worry about all these yes. answer this, cancer that. But you never know what a pink Buick's going to come running a red light and, and take you out. So that's helped. That helped her. It, it, it helps me, too, to realize that, yeah, cancer's a big deal. But, yes. but anytime, anytime, you know, we can be over, it can be something that we don't know about that, that can certainly happen. So it's really brought the brought the prospect of uh, how valuable each and every single moment of every single day is to our lives. It's, it's really enriched them in that way. But things were going along pretty well. And our story was getting out because we were being public about it, wanting to help other people. 
And I was being invited to go to places like Richmond mm -hmm. and all, all over the country to my wife and I to share our story. Yeah. And we were in a group that allowed us to do that. They paid for the expenses, so we were happy to do it. And, and my nurse at home in Cleveland said, Jim, before you do your next one, uh, stop by. You don't look quite right. I want to check your blood. So I did. And this year was really what I refer to as the year from hell, 2000 and 2012. And the look on her face told the whole story, Fred. She said, Jim, something is drastically wrong. Your, your myeloma is not showing up, but the platelets that help us from, from bleeding, bleeding unnecessarily, they, are, they, are under, they, are, they drop through the floor. Your level is dangerous. You've got to get a, something called a bone marrow biopsy right now. So we can figure out what's going on to cause this. Well, a bone marrow biopsy is unpleasant. They throw, they put you on a table, stick a huge needle in your hip bone, and suck out bone marrow from your from your middle of your hip bone. And I said, so I said to her, I said, Lee, are you sure you need to do this? You know, I've had over thirty of these so far. And she said, Oh, we're sure. So I did. And, we're, and two days later, the doctor called her home and he said, uh, Jim, bad news, you've got leukemia. And worse than that, it's, it's the variety called treatment-related leukemia. And what that means is you can't live unless you get another bone marrow transplant. And this one cannot be from your sister. It's got to be from an unrelated donor. And we don't know if we can find one, but there is a data, a donor matching database for the US and, and Europe mostly. And uh, it's going to be hard for you. And I'm not sure you're 64 at the time. He said, I'm not sure you can get through it. I'm not sure you want to go through it. So why don't you think it over with your wife? Call me back and we'll decide. I said, no, no, no need. She's listening. I'll be down in the morning. We'll get started. Well, that happened to be a wedding anniversary night. So we hung up the phone, went out and did the best we could at celebrating a wedding anniversary. Got started the next day, and that transplant was, it was a bear. It was very difficult. I was in the hospital 64 straight days. No, that's not right. 75 straight days. And the whole time, Fred, the, the, the team that would come around every day of doctors and their, their people, they were trying to lower my expectations of, of succeeding. And I kept trying to pump them up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going, no, we can do this. <laughs> oh, you know, you guys are good. You can do it. It's the same, same, same hospital, same, same group that got me through the earlier three ones. Well, things were really, really hard. I mean, three days I hallucinated, didn't know, didn't know reality from non-reality. It was rough. And of course, Kathleen got me through that because I trust her with my life. But one Sunday night that sticks out that I just got to share, I was at a real low point and the phone rang in my room. Kathleen had gone home. And it was my same doctor that admitted me to the clinical trial years earlier, Paul Richardson up in Boston at Dana. He said, Jim, I just got off the phone with your wife. I'm going to tell you what I just told her. We've got other patients who've been in your situation. They've gotten leukemia from treatments from their myeloma, and they've survived. And you can, too. Well, Fred, that meant that meant the world to me. That really, that really meant a lot because I know it was true, and it it really gave me the the hope I needed to to keep going. And 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 shortly after that, my transplant doctor came in and said, "Great news, the leukemia's 
down low enough and we found we found a match on the data matching database. And I said, oh, my prayers have been answered. When do we start? When do I get this person's cells? He said, we can't give them to you. I said, what? So he told me I couldn't live unless I had them. He said, that's right. And I said, come on. He said, no, Jim, you don't understand. We can't, we've got a, we've got a review committee and they have to think, they have to vote and, and, and on whether or not you're a reasonable risk to live through another transplant. And you've got a couple of doctors voting against you, given your history. And I said, well, just remind them that two months ago, I cycled 328 miles, four days in this bike ride that my wife put together in Leeds. And he came back the next day and he said, Jim, that convinced him. Wow. The ones who were voting no on you voted yes when they heard about, about, they said they thought this patient had the strength both physical and emotional to get through get through it. So they they gave me this this unrelated donor cells on Halloween of 2012, and by Christmas I was discharged and pronounced in remission from leukemia, where I've remained ever since. And I remained in remission uh, from myeloma throughout that whole process, where I also remain today. So it was. It was remarkable. It was a huge blessing, yes. completely unforeseen. And the funny, the funny part of this story is I learned a couple of years later that my unrelated donor lives in Germany. A German woman donated her cells to save my life, which, which kind of explains why I've got this urge to go to Oktoberfest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 get some beers, right? But but, but Jim, it, it sounds like there was a lot of you had to advocate for yourself, right? A lot of times through, throughout this process, it seems like, right? As the, you know, from the the doctor who told you how to get ready for for for, for hospital. What happened to that doctor, by the way? Did you did you fire the doctor, or was he still part of your team throughout this process? He did. The, he he started the fourth transplant, then he retired. I see. No, no, he he was gracious. When I when I came back from Boston, he congratulated me and he said, "Good call, Jim." Hmm. So I was I was pleased that he didn't he didn't like hold a grudge that yeah. you know I defied him and 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 I found that to be true of other doctors when I've when I've voiced my point of view when there's something that could go either way in terms of a a dosage or a treatment, it's not all, it's not all cut and dry there. The further, the, as the years piled up, the more there were no clear answers. It was just a lot of opinions and judgments. So I, my goal was to be part of the team yeah. and to act like I was a partner of the doctor. My wife and I were partners on that team, but we weren't the bosses yeah. because they know more about the, the science and the medicine than we'll ever know. But we know more about my case than they'll ever know. And so, yeah. so it, it's, trying, it's trying to combine those two of, okay, we've got all this data. You've got all this data. Let's work together. Yeah. And that's worked out pretty well. But I call it partnering with our medical teams. And that's that's worked out in almost all the cases. There have been a lot of doctors involved in this thing. Yeah. And I don't want to make light of, of, of this disease. There, there have been serious side effects. Side effects. I'm three inches shorter. And my back is curved. It's been over. Uh, one shoulder, the bones broke during. And, and this happens when the disease was active. Those first mm -hmm. 10 years, the bones broke. My shoulder doesn't work much. I've got metal holding that the top of the arm together. I had to have a hip replaced. And I try to learn something when I'm going through these adverse effects. For example, I asked the hip doctor, I wasn't, I wasn't that old to get a hip replacement. He said, well, that can happen to a patient, a blood cancer patient who has to take steroids as part of their treatment over a long period of time. It can make you at risk for, for uh, getting a hip replaced. So, he said, now your other hip's good. 
and he said, it may stay good, but he said, your risk is higher because of those steroids. So I didn't know that. And, and he, I just kept trying to gain information as I went along. But the most, currently the most uh, day-to-day side effect that I live with is my eyes. After my last transplant, even though the German woman cells are great at fighting the cancer, mm-hmm. they they object to some of the other parts of my body, mm-hmm. like like the surface of my eyes. They, mm-hmm. and, I, and I got left with very dry, scratchy mm-hmm. surface of my eyes. And I couldn't see it well enough to drive my car. Wow. And they hurt. And so I was looking like I was mad at everybody all the time because I was squinting. But, but it was just the, the way it was, and I couldn't get any relief at my hometown. So, again, we found we were lucky enough. And Kathleen's great at this, at, at the research effort. We're lucky enough to find a place out of town, had to go there and find, find these devices that took three weeks of training for me to figure out. I never wore contacts, but I had to figure out with a bad shoulder how to get them in every night and out every night. And so that's what enables me to see you right now and and to lead my life as I normally would. That's awesome. Sounds like other than the doctors, Kathleen has played a very significant role throughout the She has. And our, 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 our thanks to her as well. Now, Jim, we, before we wrap up here, I know you have your book here, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. But if you were to look back, um, Jim, over, over, over the course of, of this journey, what would you say are, are some of the most important lessons? I know we can't talk about all of it because it's they are all in your book, but if you were to give us, give us a Cliff Notes version, maybe three or four important lessons here for anyone walking through this um, journey, right. what would they be? Right. Yeah. Well, I think I've mentioned them. I think, I think one thing I haven't really hit on that I'd like to, and that is some people say to me to hear my story, our story, really, and they say, you've been very lucky or very blessed. And I'm the first to agree with them. We've been, we've been extremely lucky in so many ways. But I took a quote from a, from a college golf instructor who told his golfers, when they're facing a long, long putt across a hilly green to sink that putt in one stroke, of course, you're lucky, no matter how good a golfer you are. But the key is you've got to strike that ball hard enough mm. and thereby give luck a chance to happen. Mm. And I think, Fred, in a nutshell, that's what my wife and I have done is we've done everything we could think of mm-hmm. to give luck a better chance of happening. And I further believe that that all the people who take time to listen to your podcast are giving themselves a better chance mm-hmm. to have good things happen to them by expanding their, their amount, their yes. amount of knowledge yes. in the world. And I applaud you for what you're doing oh, thank very you. much. Thank you, Jim. One other, one other thing that applies beyond cancer that is a key strategy. My wife and I figured this out kind of early on we developed what we call an eight o'clock rule. And what we mean by that is at eight o'clock at night at our house, we don't talk cancer anymore. Mm. No matter how intense the situation is, we just put it on the shelf until the next day. Mm. And to be honest, it used to be a nine o'clock rule, but we're so much older now. (laughs) We made it eight o'clock and we don't stay up that long. (laughs) Just to focus, just to focus on 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 some of the positive things. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah. If it ever gets to be a seven o'clock rule, we're not telling anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I I did I did put these thoughts and a lot more in a in a short book, quick read about surviving this incurable deadly blood disease, and the name of that book is Man in the Arena. Yes. Survived multiple myeloma for since 1992. And the the profit on this book goes to charity. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's different about this book, there are other books about cancer survivors. The thing that's different about this book is it 
my focus is really on one of the things you brought up, Fred, and that is, okay, Jim, who are the people that enabled you to do this? Mm-hmm. Like the people that I work with or mentioned, and there are a lot of others that it wouldn't have happened without them. And the strategies and techniques we used are the focus of this book. It's not, the focus is not on the, you know, the, this therapy or that therapy. It's because those change with time, they get better. But certain strategies, I think, are, are, are pretty solid to, to help other people in deal, dealing with major problems in their lives. Thank you, Jim. And as we wrap up here, I always like to give um, my special guests the opportunity to address, to speak directly into the lives of viewers or listeners who, who may be going through uh, something similar. Maybe there's someone watching who may be dealing with um, myeloma or, or maybe just have know someone who, 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 who is. Um, and I want you to speak freely. I know we've been talking about this for a while, but I I want this to be that, you know, person to person um, type thing. So feel free, Jim, and, and speak to that person who may be listening um, to you right now. Well, thank you, Fred. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, first I'd say that anybody facing cancer or a friend or relative facing cancer, I'm sorry for you. And, and I know what you're going through. I lost a sister at 40, mom at 56, and dad in his 70s to different forms of cancer. So... When I was diagnosed, I thought cancer was death. And I get and <clears throat> I get that. And and that's really why I'm here today is to tell you it, it yeah, that can happen. No matter what you do, that can happen with cancer. But there are also cases like mine that are are cases that people can live normal lives. Okay, they're not exactly the same. I'm a little bit impaired, but but I'm able to have lots of happy moments, 50th wedding anniversary, you know, celebrating all the uh, all the holidays that we all celebrate. They seem to be heightened with cancer because, you, you know, we're so much more appreciative to, to be around. That can happen to you too. There's no guarantee, but <clears throat> as the pink Buick that Fred brought up, that story reminds me, there are no guarantees of any, <clears throat> anything in life. Yeah. So I guess I guess my advice is just never, ever give up. Just keep giving it the best you've got. And, <clears throat> and, and I have people reach out to me all the time from around the world because they see our story. It's out there. If you search my name and the word myeloma, you will get all kinds of videos, stories. We put it all out there. And and then if you if you'd care to send me an email, that's out there and I'll repeat it for you. It's jim.bond48 at gmail.com. And I got one this morning from an unknown patient, and I'm happy to no, I don't give any medical advice. I'm not a doctor. But if somebody says, what would you do? I, you know, I tell them what I do. Or if they just want to say anything, I, I, I try to give them some realistic hope without, without you know, being rose colored about it. Because it's deadly. Yeah. And we just got to keep making progress. Thank you so much. And that's why you're here, right? I reached out because I had a family member who unfortunately passed a few months ago to my Loma and uh, and you said yes you're willing to come on and, and share your story so this is in memory of him uh Francis Agoldo and anyone else um who, who's dealing with this um um disease but Jim thank you so much for coming there's one thing that stuck with me uh, this was towards the end you know amongst other things is strike the ball hard enough to give luck a better chance thank you Jim thank you to your dear wife Kathleen who stuck with you throughout this journey and continues, continues to do so to your to your sons, to your kids, to your partners, to everybody else who's helped make uh, made your story, um, you know, a powerful one. The man in the arena, surviving multiple myeloma since 1992. Um, if you're listening or watching, uh, you definitely want to grab that book. Um, Jim, thank you so much again for allowing your story to impact the world. And to you, our listeners, 
You're welcome. And thank you, Fred. It's my pleasure. And until next time, stay well.